hey, welcome to Mission Hills on uh, Grassroots Weekend. I, I love Grassroots Weekend. Um, just if this is your first time with us, just you know, this is not what we usually sound like. Right? This, this is kind of, we do this once a year on the 4th of July weekend. It's kind of a, a look back on the history of worship music here in the United States. And, um, and I always love doing it. And there's always a little bit of a danger, and that is that sometimes what can happen when we do this kind of thing is we can get a little nostalgic about the role that Christian faith played in our country in the past, and then that can sometimes make us a little kind of unhappy about the, the role that Christian faith plays in our country in the present, which can make us honestly a little cynical about the role that Christian faith will play in the, the future. But I need to remind us of two things today. And the first one is just this. Our hope is not in this nation. Like, you know that, right? Like, feel free to love your country, but don't pin any hopes on it. Because I got bad news for you. It's going away. It's going away. I mean, maybe it lasts until Jesus comes back, but once Jesus comes back, it's going away. I've never heard of the heavenly states of America. It's, it's going away. Our hope is not in any political power here in this country. It's, it's not in the state of this country. In fact, our, our hope is in a king who isn't here. He, he's not here now, but he is coming back, and that's where our hopes need to be. The Bible says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Right? Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our hope needs to be. Second thing I want to remind you of today is that uh, Jesus has a plan for changing the world. You might look around at the state of our country, state of the world, and you might be frustrated, and you might want to see change, and that's fine. That's good. But I want to remind you that Jesus actually has given us a plan for changing the world. And the reality is Jesus' plan for changing the world is, is a little different than sometimes the plan that the church has, has embraced. And I'm going to show you what I mean if you want to follow along. We're going to be in the book of Colossians today, Colossians 1, starting in verse 7. Colossians 1, 7. And if you're just joining us, uh, let, me, let me tell you this. Last week we saw that uh, the book of Colossians is written by a guy named the Apostle Paul, follower of Jesus named Paul, and, and a friend of his, Timothy. And they were writing to a group of followers of Jesus living in the Roman city of Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. And, and, and they were writing to them basically to say, like, you guys are doing so well. That They were writing to them to say that they had truly understood God's grace. And as we talked about that last week, grace is, it is undeserved sacrificial love. And, and when Paul said, you have understood God's grace, you've truly understood God's grace, what he was saying is basically, you, you've been delivered by God's grace, but also your lives are being defined by it. You're showing to other people the same grace that God showed you. And because of that, the gospel is spreading. And, and so now he says, Colossians 1, 7, he says, you learned it, the gospel of grace, you learned it from Epaphras our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ in our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. He says, you heard about the gospel from this guy named Epaphras and he told us that you, you embraced that gospel, but he also says he told us about your love in the Spirit. And I want to lean into that phrase. Paul says, we've heard about your love in the Spirit. What, what is that? What is love in the Spirit? Let's start with what, what kind of spirit is he talking about? And the spirit he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, I, I find for a lot of people, is, is a little bit confusing. Anybody ever been confused about how to think about the Holy Spirit? Yeah, maybe you're, maybe you're brand new to church and you're like, what, what spirit are you talking about? Or maybe, honestly, you grew up in church, but the Holy Spirit's always been just a little tiny bit fuzzy. Here's what I think is a very helpful way to think about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God working directly in our lives to make our purpose possible. Let me say that again. It's worth understanding. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. It's the person of God who's working directly in our lives in order to make our purpose possible. If you're with us last week, you may remember that we, we talked about when we say yes to following Jesus, three things happen. Number one, we're forgiven of our sin. It's just gone. It's wiped away. It's forgiven. Number two, we're adopted into God's family. And then number three, we're set apart for God's purpose. And the purpose that God's given us as followers of Jesus is to advance the gospel, is to spread the gospel further in the world. But the plan that God has for how we're going to spread the gospel is something we can't do without the Holy Spirit. We cannot live out God's plan for our purpose without God's power, without the power of the Holy Spirit, because God's plan for spreading the gospel is love. It's love. Je Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. By this, the gospel will spread if you, what's that word, church? If you love one another. 
And you might go, well, okay, hang on a second. Like, I don't know why we need the, the Holy Spirit to be able to love people because like all kinds of people have love. You know, people who don't follow Jesus, they have love. Every culture, every religion has love. So, so why would we need the Holy Spirit to have love? And the answer is because Jesus is talking about a very different kind of love than you see anywhere else in the world. The kind of love that Jesus is talking about really isn't possible because it's a very different kind of love. Here's how Jesus described the love he's talking about. He said, uh, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for, not pray against, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other one also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies. Do good to them and, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He, because God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. That's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. That's the kind of love He says is going to advance the gospel in the world. And, and I think we can probably all agree that's a little bit different kind of love than we see in the world, right? Can I get an amen on that? The world knows all about loving people who love you. But Jesus says, yeah, that's not the love we're talking about. I'm talking about the love where you love your enemies. I'm talking about the love where you have towards people, not just in, in, in attitude, but in action. I want you to do good for people who are trying to hurt you. That's the kind of love that will change everything. That's a very different kind of love. And it's a love that's impossible without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But here's what that means. I want you to follow me on this. What that means is if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've said yes to following Jesus, then the Holy Spirit has come into your life because that's the fourth thing that happens. We said there's three things. We're forgiven of our sins. We're adopted into the family of God. We're set apart for God's purpose. But the fourth thing that happens is the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and begins to move in us, working in us, changing us from the inside out and making possible what would otherwise be impossible. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit's in your life. And that means, follow me on this, it means you have a superpower. You hear me? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a superpower, which is supernatural love. Because of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have the ability to love people in a way that the world does not understand. You have the ability to love people in a way that the world has not seen. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a love that the world often hasn't seen because the church hasn't done it. I mean, here's the reality. Can we just be honest about this? Too often in the history of the church, our super ability has been a secret identity. You hear me, church? Too often in the history of the church, we haven't loved other people in the way that Jesus got. We haven't loved our enemies. We haven't done good to those who hurt us. We've actually hated them back. You know, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We've kind of gotten that backwards a lot, haven't we? No, I do to others as they do to me. Isn't that what Jesus, I mean, pretty close, right? Yeah, but it's not. And the reality is, even though we have this, this super ability, we haven't always shown it. Too often in the history of the church, our super ability has been a secret identity. They haven't seen it. But that's not true in Colossae. For this group of followers of Jesus in the Roman city of Colossae, Paul says, we've heard about your love in the Spirit. We've heard about this love that's only made possible by the Spirit. And it's because of that that the gospel is advancing. And he says, and for this reason, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And understand, he, he's not praying for them because they're getting it wrong and need to be corrected. He's praying for them because they're getting it right and they need to be encouraged to keep it going. He said, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And whenever we hear about the knowledge of God's will, uh, in the modern world, we often think about, you know, God's going to tell me specific things I need to do. So we're like, I need to know God's will. Should I, should I apply to college? Should I go to that college? Should I, should I date that girl? Should I marry this person? Should I try out for that team? Should I take that job? Should I stay here or move there? We, we want God's knowledge about specific kind of things like that. But in this context, when he's talking about the knowledge of God's will, the knowledge of God's will is knowing 
that it is God's will to love others as Jesus loved us. Do you hear me, church? That's the knowledge of his will he's talking about. He, he wants them to grow in this understanding that God's primary will for us is that we would love others the way that Jesus loved us. And he says, I, I want that to come with understanding and wisdom from the Spirit because that kind of love isn't easy to live out. That kind of love isn't easy to, to figure out. But the Holy Spirit in us will make that possible if we'll just learn to listen to him. He says, I want all this so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. He wants us to live lives that are, that are worthy of Jesus, that will please Jesus in every way. And what is a life that is worthy of Jesus? What is a life that will please Jesus in every way? It's a life that's not just delivered by grace. It's a life that is, we talked about last week, defined by grace. It's a life that's delivered by God's grace, and then it's defined by giving to others the same grace that God showed us. That's a life that's worthy of the Lord and will please Him in every way. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit. I know we got a lot of kids with us this weekend, and kids, I know that in kids' ministry this summer, you're studying the gifts of the Spirit. So I bet somebody knows the very first fruit that the Spirit starts to bring out in our lives, the very first fruit of the Spirit. Can anybody yell it out? What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Hey, can we all say that one together, church? The first fruit of the Spirit is love. Love and joy and peace and painness and, ki and kindness and, and forbearance. And, and there's a list that goes on, but it starts with love. That's the fruit. He says, the, the bearing fruit in every good work. And by the way, notice that good work, that's good deeds, okay? That's actions. He's not talking about love in attitude. He's talking about love in action that actually does things for people. What people? Our enemies and those who hate us. Growing in the knowledge of God, he says. Not, not just information about God. This is not knowing information about God. It's actually knowing God personally. It's, it's a personal relationship with God where the grace of God comes into us and then it flows out of us onto other people. It defines our relationship with other people. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Why would we need great endurance and patience? Because loving others the way Jesus loved us is hard. It's costly. It's, it's exhausting. It, it's taxing. And so he says, yeah, I, I want you to have endurance and patience to keep doing it, to keep going, even when you don't necessarily see the results. And giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he's brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he's saying there, kind of very similar to what we saw him say last week. Last week we talked, so I'm talking about the hope of heaven. And what we said is, yeah, what that means is that when our hope is in heaven, our hope is not in anything on earth, which means that we're free to use the things of earth to live on mission with Jesus. Because we're not looking at, at any treasures on, on earth and going, well, but this is where my hope is, and this is, I got to hold on to this so that I have hope in the future and that I have confidence and security. Because we don't look to those things for hope because we look to heaven. We're free to use those things to live on mission with Jesus, to, to love others in the way Jesus loved us. Now he's saying the same thing. He says, you have an inheritance in heaven. And because you have an inheritance in heaven, you don't need to worry about holding tight to all of your things here on earth. I mean, imagine for a second that somebody came and visited you this afternoon, a lawyer came and they said to you, hey, just wanted you to know, kind of a strange thing, but uh, Jeff Bezos has named you as the sole inheritor of his entire estate. <laughs> Anybody be excited by that? Can we get an amen on that one? Hey, here's the question I have you. Imagine that's happening. Imagine you know that's coming. What would you do with the resources you have right now? Would you be like, oh, I got to hold on to these as tight as I can. I got to save them up carefully. I can't afford to be generous. You'd be like, well, I can use these things for anything I want. And Jesus would say, yeah, but what if you didn't just use them for the things that you wanted? What if you used them for the things that I wanted? What if you used them to, to love other people, even those who hate you? See, if we have an inheritance in heaven, listen, because of our future inheritance, we're free to use our present resources to do good for others, even those who hate us. That's what Paul's talking about. That future inheritance changes the way we think about our present resources and what we can do with them. And my question to you today is this. What do you think would happen if we actually did that? What, what do you think would happen if we used our resources to love even our enemies, to do good even for those who hate us? What do you think would happen if we decided, you know what? 
I'm never going to let my super ability to love, I'm never going to let my super ability be a secret identity. What do you think would happen if we committed that our super ability would never be a secret identity? I think it would change everything. I think it would change everything. I think everything that we long to see happen in our country would happen. I think everything that we long to see in our country wouldn't just happen in, in our country. It would, it would happen in our, in our families, in, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our state, in our country. It would, it would change the world. That's what I think would happen. And I know some of you are like, my pastor is so naive, right? My pastor is so naive. Like, you, you really think love can do that? You really think love can overcome the political divide in this country? You really think love can overcome all the hatred and, and the racism and, and the, the injustice and the, the financial inequalities and all those problems that we were facing? You really think love could fix that? Yeah. And I don't believe it's naive because it's, it's happened. Love has done that. Eleven, twelve A.D., about 50 years after Paul wrote this letter to the church at Colossae to say, I've heard about your love in the Spirit. I've heard about your, you're not letting your super ability be a secret identity. About 50 years after that, um, the Roman emperor Trajan kind of hit some, some, some snags in his leadership, and so he, he decided to do what Roman emperors often did in those days, which was to blame the Christians. And so he, he sent out an edict. He went to all the governors in the Roman Empire. He basically said, I want you to round up the Christians, put them in jail. We'll use them as a scapegoat. And one of the governors was a man named Pliny the Younger. And, uh, and Pliny did, did what Trajan wanted him to do. He went out, he started arresting Christians. And he ran into a little bit of a problem that he didn't expect, that the Roman emperor didn't expect. And that is that there were a lot more Christians than he thought there were. In fact, there were so many of them that he ended up writing back to the, the governor for advice. And here's what he said. He said, for the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you. Kind of need to come back and get your advice. Um, especially, he said, because of the number involved. For many persons of every age, rank, and also both sexes are and will be endangered for the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities but also to the villages and farms. In other words, read between the lines. What he said was, hey, I, you know, I, I tried to do what you said. I went out, I was going to arrest the Christians. And, and it turns out they're everywhere. Like, they're everywhere. I mean, they're not just in the cities. It's, it's, it's out in the villages. It's on the farms. It's not just poor people. It's rich people. It's every rank in society. It's male and female. It's slaves. It's free. Like, they're everywhere. And, and I don't know if you knew how many there were. Fifty years after Paul wrote this, the number of, of Christians, the number of followers of Jesus had spread so much so that... that one of the Roman governors didn't even think he could follow the Roman emperor's command to arrest all of them. He said, there's too many of them. But maybe even more interestingly, he, he, he took on a little project as he was arresting some of them, and that is he, he wanted to find out what was wrong with them. He wanted to find out why they were a threat to the empire. And so he started asking questions, and he was a little confused by the answers he got, and so this is what he said to the emperor. He said, they asserted, however that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. In other words, one day a week, this was Sunday, they, they would meet before dawn and they would sing worship songs. And they met on Sunday because that was the day the resurrection happened, but they had to go before dawn. And you know why they had to go before dawn? It's because it was a work day. So that's when they did church. They did church before the sun came up on a work day. Can you imagine what would happen to church attendance today if we held worship services in the pre-dawn hours of Monday morning? But that's what the Christians were doing. He said, that's, that's what they were doing. They were singing hymns to Christ as to God, and, and they, were, they, were, they were swearing to do something. They, they were committing an oath to each other. Every week, they would basically swear to each other, I'm going to live a particular way, and here's what he said they were going to do. He said, and that to bind themselves by an oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, to never cheat anybody, not to commit theft, never to take from anybody, not to commit adultery, to always be faithful, not to falsify their trust. In other words, not to lie. 
to be men of their word, to be women of their word, nor to refuse to return a trust when it was called upon to do so. In other words, when people ask them for something, they said, yeah, we're, we're going to give it. If it's in our power, we're going to do it. And then when, it was over, when, when their meeting was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. I have no idea what guilty food is. But, but he's talking there about communion. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. And even this they affirmed they had ceased to do after my edict. In other words, he had, he had said, hey, I don't want you doing that anymore. And they had agreed not to do it anymore. After my edict by which, in accordance with your instructions, I had forbidden political associations. In other words, he had forbidden communion because it was political. How is it political? Because in communion they were celebrating Jesus not only as God but also as king. And they were saying, our loyalty is to that king. He said, you guys got to stop that because your loyalty needs to be the emperor. Accordingly, he said, because I, because I asked and I wanted to know what their problem was, what their crimes were. And all I got back was they, they would meet on Sunday morning before dawn and they'd sing hymns to, to Jesus and then swear not to do anything bad, just to do good things for people. I was like, that can't be Right? There's got to be more to that story. Accordingly, he said, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses, but I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. In other words, they, they told me what they were doing wrong, and I was like, well, there's nothing wrong with that, so you've got to be lying, so I'm going to torture a few of you. And he tortured a couple of them, and the only thing he got back was, that's all they're doing. Huh. Isn't that Interesting. Sounds a lot like a group of people who were getting together every week to go, hey, let's make sure that our super ability is not a secret identity. Let's meet together every week and let's swear to follow Jesus by doing good for others. And you know what happened? You know what that accomplished? It changed everything. 200 years after that, the, the emperor... The Roman Empire itself, the same empire that had executed Jesus, ended up embracing Jesus. That love flipped the Roman Empire upside down. It went from being a persecuted sect within the Roman Empire to being the faith of that same empire. That love changed everything. So my question to you today is, would you be willing to make that same kind of an oath on a regular basis? Would you be willing to agree today, and maybe as we go on for it, would you be willing to agree together that uh, our super ability will never be a secret identity? Would you be willing to agree to that with me? Let, let's, 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 let's bind ourselves in an oath today. Let's say it together. I'm going to count to three, and then we're just going to say, we're going to say, my secret ability, my super ability will not be a secret identity. Or I'm going to love others in the way Jesus has loved me. On three, let's do that. One, two, three. My super ability will not be a secret identity. If we actually love that way, it will change everything. You know, I've been in a lot of conversations over the years where somebody will try to get a conversation to go, they'll, they'll, they'll say like, hey, if you had one superpower, what would it be? And people go, you know, I'd like the ability to fly, you know, super speed, super strength. I, I've always been kind of a big fan of uh, <laughs> Captain America. I always thought if I had his super strength, that would be the best. But see, here's the problem with super strength. With super strength, you can win over your enemies. But with super love, you can win your enemies over. And that's way better. So here's my question for you today. Who do you need to reveal your superpower to? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a supernatural ability to love others the way Jesus loved us. Who in your life needs to know your superpower? It's, it's good to start. It's fine to start with people who love us with people who think like us, with people who agree with us. And by the way, la last week, in, in, kind of in response to the, the Roe v. Wade decision Supreme Court, we decided to take up an offering to, to share with Alternatives Pregnancy Center so that they could come alongside women who find themselves in a difficult place. 
carrying a child that they weren't expecting. And, and Mission Hills donated $75,000 last week. That is awesome. And, and actually, that, that's not really accurate. That's how much was donated to the church, but we've heard from alternatives. A lot of money is just being given straight to them. So we don't even really know what it is, but it's a lot of money. And that's fantastic. The only problem with it is that is... That's people who think like we do. It's people who agree with us. That's our friends. What enemies need to know your superpower? That's the much harder thing, but that's, that's where the power of the Spirit moves us. So who, who in your life do you have the greatest conflict with? Who, who in your life doesn't like you? And honestly, maybe you don't like them. Maybe you've got a bully at school who treats you badly. Maybe there's somebody in your neighborhood that you're just in conflict with. Maybe there's somebody at work. Maybe somebody in your family. Which of those people need to know your superpower? Let's pray on this. Would you join me? God, we're grateful for your superpower of love. Because we're told that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You didn't love us because we loved you back. You didn't love us because we did good for you. You loved the very people who executed you. And that includes us because our sin nailed you to that cross. And you went there willingly because of this love. And we recognize, Lord, that this same love that was put upon us has also been put within us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And, and if we could simply love others even our enemies, the way that you've loved us, Lord, that would change so many things that we long to see change in our culture. It's not power that's going to do that. It's not political leverage that's going to do that. It's love. Lord, do in our culture what you've done in the past. Change everything because your people agree the super ability you've given us will not be a secret identity. Lead us, Holy Spirit, as we look to live that out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.